Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from BioFire Diagnostics. Hello, uh, my name is Seth Koenig and uh, welcome to uh, another edition of this Medscape Educational Series. Um, this one is called From Principles to Practice, uh, the latest data on diagnosing acute respiratory uh, infections. Um, I am a pulmonary critical care doc and the chief of medicine and chief of pulmonary critical care medicine at Kent Hospital. And I'm delighted to uh, have with us for this program uh, two great folks. Uh, one is Dr. Larissa S. May, and she's a professor of medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Outpatient Antibiotic Stewardship at UC Davis. And also Kevin Messicar. He's an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at uh, Children's Hospital in Colorado. And at the time of this filming, this is in late 2022, the United States where we are is really in the midst of a triple demic. I know it sounds crazy, but now we have both RSV, influenza, and with a background of COVID rising. So this really is the perfect time to do a program on this multiplex PCR testing for respiratory viral infections. So over the next 30 minutes, myself and Drs. May and Messicar were going to review some of the available FDA-approved syndromic panels, what they cover, and how they can be applied in different clinical settings in patient populations. And the way we're going to do this is in the first chapter, Dr. Messicar will review the available commercial syndromic panels, and this for obviously for the upper respiratory infections as we talked about, and which pathogens are covered by these tests. And then I'll be back a little bit later uh, in chapter three to discuss some of the case examples. Hi, I'm Dr. Kevin Messicar. I'm an associate professor in the University of Colorado Department of Pediatrics and a pediatric infectious disease consultant at Children's Hospital Colorado in Aurora, Colorado. In this chapter, I'm going to provide an overview of syndromic testing for upper respiratory tract infections and go over what these tests detect. Starting with the basics of upper respiratory tract infections and the syndrome of runny nose, congestion, cough, sore throat, that can be caused by a variety of pathogens, including viruses and bacteria. And it's really a wide array of respiratory viruses, including rhinoviruses, enteroviruses, RSV, adenovirus, the parainfluenza viruses, HMPV, coronaviruses, including the seasonal coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2, and the influenza viruses. So as you can see, a wide variety of viruses can cause these upper respiratory tract infections. On the bacterial side, there are causes of bacterial sinusitis, including streptococcus pneumoniae and H. flu, causes of atypical pneumonia, like mycoplasma pneumoniae and chlamydophila pneumoniae, and then causes of whooping cough, like bordetella pertussis and paraportussis. It's been a pretty unusual year in 2022 for respiratory infections. We saw many endemic viral respiratory illnesses really go away with the pandemic measures that we were using for COVID in 2020 and 2021. And as we lifted those NPIs, we've seen these respiratory illnesses res resurge and they're resurging in really unusual ways. So we're seeing altered seasonality, viruses that used to come in the winter like RSV and influenza coming earlier than typical. We're seeing larger than typical spikes like with the RSV spike we're seeing right now. And then atypical age distribution, so older children being affected than we would have expected in a typical season. Unfortunately, this RSV wave, as it starts to ebb, is being followed by an early and increasing amount of influenza activity. This has most commonly been influenza A, particularly H3N2 viruses. Most infections occurring initially in children and in young adults, but really spreading now throughout the population. And important to remember in the background is Still SARS-CoV-2, it continues to circulate in all states, and many are expecting a wintertime surge with the BQ1 and BQ1.1 variants on the rise. 
So how do we get a laboratory diagnosis of what is the cause of these respiratory infections? There are our traditional microbiologic techniques like culture, which is the gold standard for bacterial disease, uh, going out of favor for viruses due to the, the uh, amount of time consuming labor that it takes to do that in the lab. We have antigen testing, which can provide a really good rapid result for things like influenza and of particular use SARS-CoV-2 and at-home COVID testing is typically done by antigen testing. We have singleplex PCR testing that can give a, us a yes or no answer, looking for the genes of influenza, COVID, or RSV. Then these can be combined into these limited multiplex PCR panels. These are duplex or triplex molecular PCR tests. And many manufacturers have combined the influenza targets, the SARS-CoV-2 target, and the RSV target in this triple demic to help us to differentiate which of those uh, currently circulating viruses is the cause of respiratory illness. Then there's the broader syndromic multiplex PCR testing platforms. These provide broad coverage of viral and bacterial pathogens, typically including influenza and since 2021, SARS-CoV-2. There is a differentiation between which panels are FDA cleared for upper respiratory specimens. So those are nasopharyngeal, midturbinate, or nasal specimens. And those include platforms by BioFire, Genmark, Luminex, and Nanosphere, amongst many others uh, in the upper respiratory tract realm. Then there are fewer lower respiratory tract specimen testing platforms or pneumonia panels, including that from BioFire and Univera listed here. Each of these panels has their own set of targets. Uh, many of them have common targets, including the bacteria that we had talked about before, uh, Bordetella pertussis being common amongst them. Um, but there are differences between each of these platforms. Uh, most are looking for the common causes of walking pneumonia, including Chlamydophila and Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Most are looking for the common viruses, including adenoviruses, the seasonal coronaviruses, HMPV, and nearly all of them can't differentiate the rhinoviruses from the enteroviruses. So you see that common target readout of rhino enterovirus. Most of them can detect the influenza viruses and can differentiate influenza A from influenza B. Most can differentiate all four strains of influenza virus or parainfluenza virus one, two, three, and four. And then most detect RSV and some can differentiate A from B. Fortunately, many of these panels have been updated to include a SARS-CoV-2 target, which is particularly helpful during this pandemic, including many of the uh, examples listed on the side here. Weighing the benefits versus drawbacks of this syndromic PCR diagnostic testing, on the pro side, we see that these panels can simultaneously test for many pathogens that can cause very similar clinical syndromes. They can do it with high sensitivity and specificity, and very rapidly, some with results coming back in less than an hour with very little tech hands-on time and very little tech knowledge needed. These are really plug and play technologies. On the con side, these are not unbiased technologies. They can only see what's on the panel. So if there's something you're looking for that's not a target, these tests aren't gonna detect that. And most importantly, they may not necessarily change management. And this is particularly true in the pediatric realm where we see many common viral illnesses, be it upper respiratory tract illnesses or bronchiolitis, where many of the viral causes are self-limited. And it really doesn't matter which virus caused it, the child will improve on their own. And you may not warrant testing in, in many of those scenarios. Fortunately, it's not just uh, an impact on patient care. There's a variety of uh, purposes for this testing. It could impact both patient care, infection control and prevention, as well as serve some public health purposes. On the patient care side, it allows us to identify a pathogen specific cause of disease presentation, which if you find a treatable organism can help you start effective therapy. Or if you're looking for a cause for the patient's symptoms, like a patient with fever of unknown origin, finding a viral cause such as adenovirus might help you stop unnecessary antibiotics and limit further workup. On the infection control side, it can help guide patient isolation and protective equipment recommendations, particularly during the pandemic when we were testing for SARS-CoV-2, and really can help inform quarantine, isolation, and re return to work recommendations, not only for COVID, but for other uh, pathogens of public health significance like pertussis and influenza. And on the public health side, the reporting of these pathogens through this testing really helps us track pathogen epidemiology, identify outbreaks, and guide our preparedness and response. 
In the next chapter, we'll move from the lab to the clinical setting where Dr. Larissa May will discuss the clinical applications as well as impact of syndromic PCR testing for respiratory tract infections. Thanks for watching. Welcome, I'm Dr. Larissa May. I'm a professor of emergency medicine at the University of California Davis School of Medicine in Sacramento, California. In this chapter, I'm going to discuss the application of syndromic testing for upper respiratory tract infections in various clinical settings. So why test for respiratory infections? There are numerous reasons, depending on clinical setting, to do this. First off, diagnostic stewardship is very important, especially in this era of limited supplies and value-based care. Using these respiratory panels can inform or stop additional testing for other pathogens and help guide management. In addition, particularly on the outpatient side, this can be a great tool to use for patient education and shared decision-making by helping inform and counsel patients on their potential prognosis and signs to watch for for worsening infection. For the inpatient setting and the emergency department, use of these tests can guide isolation precautions and help facilitate infection prevention and transmission of these pathogens, both in the hospital as well as long-term care facilities. And finally, an important patient safety issue is the opportunity to promote antimicrobial stewardship, helping avoid use of antibiotics in patients for whom they're unnecessary, as well as avoiding overuse and prolonged broad spectrum antibiotics where they can be de-escalated. Unfortunately, clinicians are not very good at diagnosing particular infections based on clinical signs and symptoms alone. There is a lot of overlap between the symptoms of RSV, influenza, and COVID-19, and thus confirmatory testing for these respiratory diseases can help guide clinical management of patients, particularly for influenza and COVID-19, where we do now have therapeutics. There are some evolving rationales as well for respiratory infection testing in the modern era. As I just mentioned, as more of these therapeutics became available, the test to treat model is relevant for not only SARS-CoV-2 influenza, but in the future likely for RSV and other viral pathogens. Furthermore, as new tools and infection prevention protocols are developed, testing also becomes important for clinical management decisions, particularly where we need to cohort patients in crowded settings and in long-term care facilities. So how should clinicians decide whether to employ multiplex testing for respiratory tract infections? In the emergency department, these tests can provide resource and diagnostic stewardship. Typically, they are available at the point of care and can help guide treatment decisions as well as disposition decisions. On the outpatient side, they may provide value, especially for high-risk patients, such as those who are severely immune compromised, including post bone marrow transplant patients. In the inpatient setting, particularly for pediatrics, testing can assist infection prevention and prevent transmission of pathogens between patients who are admitted to the hospital. And it also promotes antibiotic stewardship since most of these respiratory tract infections have a viral etiology. It's important to note that routine retesting may not be necessary. And finally, in the critical care setting in the ICU, Ideally, one would want to get lower respiratory tract specimens for which there are now rapid panels available for those. They can be more difficult to obtain. However, in critically ill patients, sputum and bronchoalveolar lavage specimens uh, are frequently done and can help provide quantitative results. So how do we as clinicians decide which types of tests we should be using? Recently, molecular tests have become more commonplace and are generally preferable in emergency departments as they tend to be more sensitive and specific. And point of care systems can offer quite rapid turnaround times of 20 minutes or less. In the office or home-based setting, in patients who may not be as severely ill, antigen tests can also provide rapid turnaround times, often at the expense of some sensitivity and specificity. However, their widespread availability improves healthcare equity and they can also be very useful in assisting patients determining when they can return back to school or work, particularly for COVID-19. There is a bit of controversy about the clinical utility of these tests in various settings. I'm going to talk just briefly about a study that we did at UC Davis uh, with a syndromic panel in the past few years. 
we enrolled 191 patients in a randomized controlled trial evaluating on-demand respiratory pathogen testing compared to our usual care in the emergency department for patients with signs and symptoms of respiratory tract infection. 93 received the rapid pathogen testing and 98 received usual care. The bar graph on the right uh, shows our primary outcome, which was the percent of patients in each arm receiving antibiotics. While we were not able to demonstrate statistical significance, given that we likely did not have enough power in this study, we did find a trend towards uh, less use of antibiotics in the RP arm. That magnitude was greater in children compared to adults. There was no difference, however, in antiviral use length of stay or ED disposition, suggesting that more study needs to be done regarding the clinical utility of syndromic panels in the emergency department. These tests, I should note, may become more valuable given uh, this particular respiratory tract season where viruses seem to not be following their typical seasonal patterns. So there is a role of rapid diagnostics in acute infection. Given that clinicians often have trouble diagnosing particular viral infections without testing, they tend to employ a very conservative management approach, erring on the side of more rather than less antibiotic use. So there's some opportunities and challenges for these rapid molecular diagnostic tests in acute care settings, uh, particularly in the emergency department. Uh, and there are a number of applications of potential testing strategies. However, we do need to consider in various clinical settings what the appropriate integration is into the clinical environment. So for example, in terms of workflow assessment, these tests may be difficult to perform in the outpatient setting in a setting where there's only five or 10 minutes to see a patient in terms of, do you call the patient back after the point of care returns, or do you have a space to put the patient to wait for the results? We also need to get buy-in and support from clinical operations on the ED and inpatient side. And another important consideration, particularly as we think about patient safety, is the opportunity to use these tests to educate clinicians and patients around antimicrobial stewardship and avoid unnecessary and prolonged broad spectrum antibiotic use. In the next chapter, Dr. Koenig will put syndromic testing for respiratory tract infections into context with some patient vignettes. Thank you for your attention. Well, hello, I'm back. And this is Dr. Seth Koenig again. And as promised, in this chapter, I'm going to review three short patient cases. And in, in the first case, uh, this case is taking place in the emergency department, a real case that we saw not long ago. This is a 63-year-old male severe COPD, which is sort of my bread and butter in pulmonary, uh, presents in the emergency department with fever, cough, and malaise. Uh, he is on and normally is on two liters of nasal cannula uh, at home, and his shortness of breath has remained stable, and his oxygen saturation is above 90%. His physical examination, he does look tired, and he is in a little bit of respiratory distress, maybe from the fever that he has, uh, and his breath sounds are diminished bilaterally, which is likely to be chronic. His chest radiograph really just shows typical COPD lungs where they're hyperinflated, but without any uh, infiltrates. His labs, they're fairly normal, and his ECG uh, shows no ischemic changes, obviously something you'd want to look for in a 63-year-old with uh, pre-existing COPD. And so the real question is, should a syndromic upper respiratory panel be used for this patient? And in, in, in my opinion, and as a pulmonary person and as an emergency department person, we recognize that these patients are really, uh, they don't have a lot of wiggle room if they're going to get better or they're going to get worse. And so we would like to nail down these diagnoses uh, very clearly and quickly and in this case, a full syndromic URI panel is ordered, and it turns out to be positive for human metanumovirus. Now, again, for those who might not know, human metanumovirus can cause a lot of damage inside people, uh, especially folks who have underlying lung disease. So for this patient, he's not going to need re to receive treatment now for influenza, which is in the community, or COVID, which and he will get prescribed azithromycin. And that azithromycin really is for the regular treatment of a COPD exacerbation. So the key takeaway for this patient is, for me, it's better to have a full panel 
And that's because I don't wanna miss the many possible causes of a URI in a patient with pretty bad pre-existing COPD. If we move on to case two, this would be more in the acute care setting, an urgent care, primary medical care for a sick visit. And this is a nine-year-old girl who presents at urgent care with a high fever, 102.7, cough, runny nose, your typical constitutional-like symptoms that started the previous night. On physical, her ears are clear and her physical exam otherwise is unremarkable. Now her mom says many of the girl's friends are sick, but she doesn't know um, if they've been tested for anything. So again, the question comes down, should a syndromic upper respiratory panel be used for this patient? And we ask ourselves that question because what is the most likely diagnosis in a time frame where influenza, COVID, and RSV is running wild out in the community? So in this case, we decided to do a limited panel and it's positive for influenza. So again, this person now or this child can be managed symptomatically and so the key takeaway here is based on the patient presentation and the history and the recent surge in these types of viruses, likely this virus was going to be one, and that happens to be part of the limited panel. And then the last case is more complicated in, in certain respects because this is a 58-year-old female with lung cancer with metastasis to the liver and advanced COPD who's admitted to the ICU for respiratory failure. And she was doing well on immunotherapy until a few days ago when she developed a minimally productive cough and fever. And when she was seen by the oncologist, she was told to go to the emergency room, where there she appeared anxious, she appeared to be using some accessory muscles, and she required very high levels of oxygen via high-flow nasal oxygen at 60 liters per minute and 80% FiO2. The CT scan showing representative images of her, of the rest of her scan, really shows a diffuse process uh, with ground glass opacities. And in a setting like this, in an ICU, in a patient who has this past medical history and who's on chemo and immunotherapies, there's a very broad differential diagnosis. And we want to make sure that we have the right one. So the rapid test in the emergency room was initially negative for the SARS-CoV-2, right? So no COVID and influenza. So those are negative. But on exam again in the ICU, she has bilateral crackles and her labs reveal pre-renal azotemia, mildly increased WBC count with a lymphocyte predominance and a very, very low platelet count. So the question here again, uh, is should a syndromic upper respiratory uh, panel be used for this patient? And this patient has a broad differential diagnosis and also has infiltrates that are on uh, the pulmonary parenchyma. And so here we're worried that um, this could also, uh, it may have started as an upper respiratory process, but now is involving the lower respiratory tract. However, uh, this patient has zero sputum and was having a tough time bringing up anything, including being able to cough, probably just from being weak. So the broad differential diagnosis, though, still consists of an immunotherapy-induced pneumonitis with systemic symptoms, and I've seen these people develop what appears to be sepsis. It could be the, pro pro the progression of her cancer. However, again, that would be uh, very quick, uh, and the likely process would be an infection. And again, which infection is this going to be? So in this case, I think an upper respiratory panel would be appropriate, especially if we see something that is consistent with what she could have. On the other hand, if that isn't, or we are suspect that there might be two processes going on, we might have to move to a more a dangerous or more invasive way of getting a specimen. So in this, in this case, the syndromic testing is ordered. Now the panel, does reveal adenovirus. And again, if this were uh, any other person per se, we may or may not use this as a as dis disclosure of, a, of the definite uh, diagnosis. But again, life isn't so simple for us in, in a clinical environment. And here we have a virus that is known to uh, very much cause alveolar and pulmonary infiltrates, just as she has seen, along with the constitutional symptoms. So here the key takeaway is that immunocompromised patients 
they might need a more invasive diagnostic procedure. So I'm going to start off with the full syndromic panel to see if I get a diagnosis, recognizing the fact that a lower respiratory tract sample might indeed be necessary. I'll be back to discuss the impact of multiplex PCR testing for these infections on real world outcomes. Thanks for your attention with this. So this is the last chapter and here I'm gonna conclude the program by presenting some of the data on the impact that these multiplex PCR testing for these upper respiratory tract infections have sort of in the real world. And here was a, was a, a well done meta analysis of 25 different studies looking at these molecular tests and the first on the top, the impact of the use of antibiotics, which they showed nine of 25 studies were included, seven of them out of nine showed a reduction in antibiotic therapy. And so again, why might that be the case? Well, again, if we find a virus and we don't find a bacteria, one might hope uh, that in the right clinical sense, we wouldn't need to use an antibiotic. And the same thing was sort of seen uh, in the other way, in the use of antivirals, where 11 of 25 studies uh, showed that nine of them showed improved antiviral use when you obviously get a virus that we have some sort of, of treatment for. Uh, also, what was shown in a, in a study was the impact on infection control measures. And again, you can imagine that if certain viruses uh, require uh, different types of isolation and vice versa. We do not want to isolate folks uh, who do not need to be isolated. We know uh, that that is an issue. And obviously for the COVID pandemic, this was a huge issue in regards to public health. Uh, this was an interesting study where the respiratory viral testing on antibiotic prescribing among children who presented to the emergency department. And here, it was a large number of of visits, 931, and the key outcomes showed that about 85% or almost 800 of them, uh, the tests were positive. And in the intention to treat group, this is the group who the patient received the test and the physician was told about the results, as opposed to the control group where they may or may not have been told about the results. And here in the group that were supposed to be told the results, there really seemed like they were more likely to receive antibiotics with no significant differences in antiviral prescribing medical visits and hospitalizations. And so that sort of the take home message of that study was that rapid testing in the emergency department did not decrease antibiotic prescribing. However, when the secondary outcomes were looked at and when carefully one looked at the way that the study progressed, there were about 150 of the patients in the intention to treat group where the physician did not learn about the results. So while with an intention to treat didn't show there was a decrease in bacterial prescribing, we might want to think about if 150 more of those doctors would have learned about the results, maybe there would have been a decrease in bacterial antibacterial use. Uh, here's just another a study looking at what is it when you have standard PCR versus the rapid PCR in regards to a positive test, influenza diagnosis, median turnaround time, median time to uh, result from admission, median length of stay. These are all extremely important things in hospitalized patients and emergency room patients. And here, if you look at the row that says rapid PCR, the number of positive tests statistically went up, which showed it to be more sensitive. The influenza rates went up, again, showing it to be uh, more accurate, and the turnaround times and time to result in the median length of stays all went down when we use these rapid PCRs. And again, just another uh, study looking at the, a large group of patients and whether or not empiric antibiotics and antiviral use were changed when we use these respiratory panels. And you can see uh, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, under the film array respiratory panel, that empiric antibiotics went down significantly when we had these rapid tests that were going to look at all sorts of different types of upper respiratory tract infections. That antiviral use went up significantly when we were able to uh, pick up influenza. Uh, 
And again, just like we have seen, the median turnaround time for these tests and length of stays and things of that nature all were improved when we use these rapid diagnostic testing. Again, no surprise here on this slide that COVID positive samples, so there were 33 COVID positive samples and then clinically 17 negative examples that were previously tested through the laboratory when one of the panels for the rapid respiratory uh, testing was done, you see here under the sensitivity that, that it picked up a heck of a lot more from 85% to 97%. And so while the specificity remains at 100, a positive test is a positive test, here we can see that we can pick up more, uh, more virus. And again, you know, when we talk about cost effectiveness, which we really do need to talk about because this is part of the real world, whether or not this is going to have an effect is probably going to take a lot more time. However, some truths are just obviously a positive because they, they exist because if you think about it, in an outpatient setting, in an emergency department, in an inpatient setting, the faster you receive an accurate diagnosis, uh, the decrease in length of stay, duration utilization of antibiotics, imaging studies, your lab utilization, these things tend uh, all to go down. And so in closing, rapid PCR tests for upper respiratory tract infections, um, the, the turnaround times for results are clearly impacted and clearly shown to sh be shortened. And, and now we're starting to see that this may shorten stays in hospitals and in the emergency department, reduce the unnecessary antibiotic use, and hopefully lower healthcare costs. Not all the studies, as even we've shown here, have shown benefit. And so the use of highly multiplex tests may not be justified in all settings and circumstances. Sometimes you just might need limited multiplex tests. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about being familiar with the tests that you order and understanding what to do with those test results. We all very much thank you for participating in this activity and please uh, continue to answer the questions that follow and to complete the evaluation.